happy. Um, today we have Ted Chang, who's here for us as, as part of Speculations. The future is um, a series of conversations and talks about uh, where we ask people to, to talk about an aspect of the future in, in, in different ways. Um, this is a series that's been kind of going on all summer and will continue. Um, what do we have? Next up, we have on Monday, we have Fatima al Qadiri coming in. Thursday, Thursday, okay. Um, and I forget who else is on the schedule, but check, check our schedule to see other things. Um, right now, we're very pleased to have Ted Chang, who you probably know from his fantastic science fiction, um, his collection, Stories of Your Life and Others, um, is pivotal. Um, and I'm very excited to hear what he has to say. At 2 p.m., we, we discussed in the other room um, Ben, why am I like, Ben Rosenbaum's story. Rosenbaum story, the guy who, who worked for money. Yeah. Um, and enjoy Ted Chang. So, uh, okay, is this working? I think it is. All right. Okay. Um, hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Okay, so, um, there's a senior research scientist at Microsoft named Gordon Bell, and for the last 15 years or so, he has been engaged in a project where he has been saving a record of uh, virtually everything he does. His computer uh, records every keystroke he types on his keyboard. He uh, keeps an audio recording of every phone conversation he has. He wears a camera around his neck that automatically takes uh, up to 1,000 snapshots a day, including every person that he talks to and every room that he enters. He even uh, saves a copy of every page that he reads when he is surfing the web. What Gordon Bell is doing is uh, sometimes called uh, life logging. Uh, he is keeping a detailed record of everything he does every day of his life. And uh, there are a number of people who are uh, engaged in life logging, but uh, Gordon Bell has taken it farther than most. Uh, because of his position as a research scientist, he was able to get uh, software custom written designed for his needs uh, which he uses to help navigate all the information that he's collected. Uh, however, uh, not even he has taken life logging as uh, far as it can go. Um, I remember attending a talk on the future of personal computing at around the time that uh, Gordon Bell started work on his project, and uh, the, sp the speaker pointed out that one day it would be possible to keep a permanent video recording of every moment of your life. Uh, and that was a pretty bold statement at the time, because back then, a gigabyte of hard disk space cost about $100, and uh, people did not store much video on hard disks because of that. Uh, but even at that time, it was reasonable to predict that computer storage would get cheaper and cheaper. And nowadays, a gigabyte of hard disk space costs less than 10 cents. Uh, we are not yet at the point where it would be affordable to record continuous video of your entire life, but we are definitely getting there. And when we do, it will be possible for you to wear a camera, uh, maybe around your neck, uh, that doesn't simply take snapshots, but actually records audio and video of uh, every single thing you see and do. Now, um, you might ask, why would anyone do that? Uh, well, before YouTube came along, I would never have imagined uh, people uploading videos of their cats for the rest of the world to watch. But when uh, data storage becomes so cheap that it is essentially free, you can be sure that people will find ways to make use of it. Um, also consider that a lot of people are um, already engaged in a primitive form of life logging if you save all of your emails, if you post photos on Flickr, if you regularly update your status on Facebook, if you use Twitter or Foursquare or various other social networking applications, uh, you are uh, essentially creating a life log, even if life logging wasn't explicitly your intention. And I think that uh, we're headed in the direction of ever more extensive life logging uh, which is why I want to talk about 
some of the ways that it might affect us to have continuous video of our entire lives. Now, um, the most uh, obvious uh, objection is privacy. When you talk to someone, you don't want them recording every word you say. And uh, Gordon Bell's girlfriend often asks him to delete recordings of things she has said to him. And uh, right now, a lot of people hate the idea of being re recorded with a cell phone video camera when they're at a party. And uh, if you have uh, heard about Google Glass, you know, the new uh, uh, sort of cell phone in a pair of glasses, uh, you probably heard that there's been some pushback against it. There are a lot of establishments which are um, banning uh, Google Glass because they want their patrons to feel comfortable uh, without uh, fear of being recorded. Um, and, you know, it, uh, it is definitely true that if we knew that everything we did was being recorded, we might become very, very guarded about everything we say, as if we were all politicians uh, holding a press conference you know, every moment of our lives. Uh, and, you know, you know that politicians at a press conference, they, they don't say very much. So, uh, it is entirely possible that people's desire for privacy will prevent video life logging from ever taking off, and that we simply uh, will not permit anyone to record us. On the other hand, it is also the case that um, our expectations of privacy are steadily decreasing. Uh, we have a lot less privacy now than we did 20 years ago, and for the most part, we have not complained. A lot of young people are accustomed to living their lives in public simply because of the importance that social networking has in their lives, and they don't even really comprehend older people's objections to it. Uh, some of you were here for the two o'clock session in which uh, we discussed a story set in a world where people are perfectly comfortable broadcasting their daily activities for anyone to see. Now, you know, privacy is a very important issue, and uh, we could talk about the various you know, uh, pro and con arguments about it uh, for hours, but um, privacy is not what I wanted to discuss here today. So, just for the purposes of this discussion, let's imagine a system of video life logging in which the privacy issues have been resolved to your satisfaction. So, like, you can imagine that you wear a device that records everything you see and hear and say, but that information is all stored on a server in your own home. No one else has access to it unless you explicitly share it with them. No one is going to embarrass you with evidence of something foolish you did. It is purely for your own personal consumption. So, if you imagine that, what is that like? How does it affect you if you have a complete video and audio recording of your entire life? So, the first thing to consider is that this type of uh, video life log would not be like uh, your wedding video that you hired someone to record, because uh, that's something that you watch only once in a, in a long while. Uh, with advances in search technology, uh, this video life log can be treated as a database that you can search just as easily as you search the web. Uh, for example, if you assume that all the speech recorded on your life log is converted into text, that makes it possible to search on anything you said or heard anyone else say. Then you can launch queries like, what was the name of that book that Tom recommended when we had lunch? Uh, or, you know, you know, a future search engine will also have a lot of, you know, semantic information about the imagery that it records. So you can, you know, launch a search like, what's the name of that musician that I met at that Christmas party? And it will, it will come up with the answer. Now, if you consider how many times you use Google in a day, especially if you, you know, have a smartphone, uh, 
most, a lot of people are using Google a lot. Now, if you could do Google searches on your own life, doesn't that sound like it might be useful? Anything that you don't remember, you can just look it up in your life log. Even, even trivial stuff like, what did I have for dinner on my birthday last year? So another question that I want to, um, the real question that I want to consider is, how will having a video recording of your entire life affect your native memories? Now, it's very tempting to believe that it won't affect you at all, that your memory will remain as good as it, now, as it is now, and you will only consult your video life log on those occasions when you can't remember something. But uh, I don't believe that that's what will happen because of uh, the many ways that technology has uh, affected our ability to rem remember already. Now, um, the oldest example is, of course, the written word. Uh, Socrates supposedly criticized the use of writing because it would cause people to stop using their memories. He said, it will implant forgetfulness in their souls. They will cease to exercise memory because they rely on that which is written, calling things to remembrance no longer from within themselves, but by means of external marks. And Socrates definitely had a point. When bards in ancient Greece performed the Iliad and the Odyssey to an audience, they recited thousands of lines of poetry from memory, and we hardly see anyone able to do that today, because no one needs to do that today. And if that seems like a very remote example, you know, we can you know, easily come up with uh, more modern ones. Uh, a lot of people have become uh, so reliant on turn-by-turn -turn directions of their GPS that they have trouble finding their way around their own city without it. A, there was a recent study which found that um, uh, about 30% of people under the age of 30 uh, can't remember their own phone number because uh, they don't remember anyone's phone number. All their phone numbers are on their cell phone. Uh, and you know, those are you know, very specific and therefore you know, easy to point to examples. But uh, I think uh, something similar is working with, the, with Google and the internet itself. We all have ready access to Google, and so we can find out all sorts of information right away. Uh, has that weakened our memory of general knowledge about the world? Again, it is very tempting to think that it has not, but uh, there is actually good reason to think that it has. Uh, a couple of years ago, a team of psychologists conducted a study. Uh, they presented a bunch of participants with uh, 40 pieces of trivia, and the participants were told to type this into a computer. Half of the participants were told that what they had typed would be stored and saved. The other half were told that it would be deleted. Later on, the psychologists tested the participants' memory of what they had typed. And the subjects who had been told that it would be erased had significantly better recall than the ones who had told it would be saved. It turns out that people don't pay as much attention to what they read when they think they'll be able to look it up later. And, you know, this kind of makes sense, because when you know you can always look it up later, you know, you know why would you bother memorizing it? And you know, this, you know, this is at work on all of us. The more that we use the internet, the more our brains shift away from remembering information itself and remembering to, they shift toward remembering how to find the information that we're looking for. And I have to admit, I can see this happening in myself. I am not happy about it, but I don't really know of a way to stop this without giving up using the internet altogether, and uh, I'm not willing to do that. It is something that uh, sneaks up on you and until it's too late. And this is why I think it is uh, likely that we will eventually come to rely on video recording 
instead of our own native memories when you know, recalling events from our lives, our past lives, yeah, earlier in our life. It, it's not going to be a deliberate choice, but when your life log becomes as easily searchable as the web is now, your habits will evolve and your brain will adapt to reinforce those habits. And when we want to know so something that happened to us, we will start looking it up instead of recalling it directly. Now, uh, on the one hand, this may sound pretty dire. The prospect that our native memories will atrophy and we'll be unable to remember our own lives without consulting our life logs. On the other hand, if you think of your life log as your memory, then your memory is actually improved. You now have a complete, extraordinarily detailed memory of everything that has ever happened to you. Now, so to, to help us to, uh, think about what it might be like to have a perfect memory, uh, first, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about what it's like to have an imperfect memory. Uh, I don't know if any of you were here a few weeks ago when um, the author uh, Samuel Delaney spoke at this, uh, at this venue. Uh, many years ago, Delaney wrote a memoir entitled The Motion of Light in Water. And uh, he starts off by talking a, a bit about the experience of what it's like to write a memoir. He says that uh, when he was younger, when people asked him about his father, he would say, my father died of lung cancer in 1958 when I was 17. And Delaney has very clear memories of the days leading up to his father's death. He remembers that his father listened to uh, the station WBAI on the radio and that he was listening to a piece of music called Sonata for Unaccompanied Cello. Uh, Delaney even remembers that it was the conductor Penderecki who was performing it. 20 years later, after Delaney had become famous as an author, a couple of scholars wanted to write a biographical essay about him. And uh, these scholars pointed out some discrepancies in his account of his father's death. Delaney was born in 1942, so he could not have been 17 in 1958. The scholars did some more research, and they discovered that the radio station WBAI had not even yet begun broadcasting in 1958. And uh, Penderecki had not yet recorded Sonata for Unaccompanied Cello. Eventually, they found a copy of a local newspaper that carried his father's obituary. And it turned out that his father died in 1960, not in 1958, and that Delaney was 18 when it happened, not 17. Now, it's pretty unusual to misremember an event as significant as the death of your father. And in Delaney's case, it's especially odd because if you read his memoir, it is clear that he has a remarkably good memory. So how did he get the year of his father's death wrong? Delaney, you know, obviously, he cannot answer that question definitively. But he does offer, you know, uh, some hints at a possible explanation. He began college the month before his father died, and he also has very clear memories of starting college. He remembers the teachers he took classes from, and the new friends that he was making, and the extracurricular activities that he was participating in. And it was a very exciting time for him. Uh, in fact, the emotional tenor of those memories was so different from that of his father's death that he could not put them right next to each other in his mental chronology. It made more sense for his subconscious to put two years of subjective experience between his memories of starting college and his memories of his father's death. And if it weren't for the documentation that those biographers uncovered, he would never have believed that those, those two events took place only a month apart. Now, I've always found this anecdote of Delaney's to be fascinating, because most of the time, when you think about the shortcomings of your own memory, you think of the times that you tried to remember something, but you couldn't call it to mind. But what about the times that you, know, you do remember an event, but you 
that event didn't actually happen that way. These are failures of your memory that you don't even realize are failures. And so after I read Delaney's memoir, I began to wonder, how accurate is my own memory? There are plenty of episodes in my past that I remember very clearly, but I cannot produce any documentation to support them. How do I know that those events happened the way that I remember them? I can't know for sure, and I have to say, you know, it's a little disconcerting. The example of Delaney misremembering the year of his father's death is uh, obviously striking, and it may be, for, for that reason, it may be hard for the rest of us to relate to. So um, let's consider a much more ordinary example. Uh, the author, Isaac Asimov, he wrote a an autobiography called In Memory Yet Green. And in it, he mentions that when he was young, his mother used to beat him with a rope. Many years later, he was having a conversation with his mother, and she said he had always been a good boy. And he said, how could I have been a good boy if you had to hit me with a rope? And his mother said, never. I never hit you with ropes. Now, I think a lot of us have had similar conversations with our parents. We remember things one way, and our parents remember it another. And in this particular example, I think the discrepancy between Asimov's memory and his mother's memory is very easy to explain. In the 1920s and 30s, when Asimov was a boy, it was perfectly acceptable to beat your child with a rope. A few decades later, when Asimov was having this conversation with his mother, it was less so. So I don't think his mother was deliberately lying when she said she never beat him. I think it's that she thought of herself as a good mother, and so she couldn't have done anything that a good mother wouldn't have done. So she subconsciously edited her memory to conform to contemporary standards of child rearing. Now, if Asimov had been keeping a video life log, he could certainly prove to his mother that she used to hit him with a rope. He could act like the biographers who showed Delaney documentation that proved his recollection of his father's death was incorrect. But that is not what I think is most interesting about the possibility of a video life log. The more interesting question to me is, if Asimov's mother had been keeping a video life log, would she have been able to forget that she used to hit her son with a rope? Would she have been able to edit her memory to make herself look good? Now, uh, neuroscientists have found that the very act of recalling a memory can change the contents of that memory by creating new associations with it. And this is why a person's recollection of an event changes over repeated retellings. Over time, they are replacing their memory of what actually happened with the memory of the story they told over and over again. And this is how stories become exaggerated how that fish that your uncle once caught started out this big and eventually be became this big. But digital video isn't going to change no matter how many times you replay it. That means if we use our life logs regularly, our memories cannot evolve over time in the same way. In some contexts, this is undoubtedly a good thing. For example, in matters of crimes or accidents, uh, what eyewitnesses report they saw often changes depending on the wording of the questions that, that the police ask them or what they hear someone else say. With video life logs, that would no longer be a problem. But in the context of our memories of our own lives, is it a good thing or a bad thing that our memories evolve over time? Psychologists once performed a study where they asked a bunch of people their positions on a number of different political questions, like legalization of marijuana, rights of the accused, equality for women. Then, nine years later, the psychologists went back to those same people and asked them their opinion on those issues. Some people's, their views had stayed the same, other people, their views had changed. But then, when they were asked to remember how they felt about these issues nine years ago, they all said 
their views had been the same as they were now. If they were in favor of legalizing marijuana, they claimed that they had always been in favor of legalizing marijuana, even if they had once been opposed to it. And uh, this is what psychologists call consistency bias. The thought that we might be contradicting ourselves makes us uncomfortable, so we unconsciously edit our memories to avoid that problem. And I think this is uh, pr pretty much exactly what was at work with Asimov's mother. There was, an, there was another study in which uh, psychologists surveyed a, a large number of married women. They asked them questions like how happy they were with their marriages, how many interests did they share with their husbands, th things like that. Then, 10 years later, the psychologists go back to these same women and ask them the same questions. And then they also ask them, how did you answer this question 10 years ago? It turns out that uh, a number of the women remembered that their earlier they remembered their earlier responses as being more negative than they actually were. They felt that their marriage had improved over the years, that their marriage was better, that they had more in common with their husbands now. And this is what uh, psychologists call change bias, because we like the idea that some things improve over time, that love grows deeper. So again we unconsciously edit our memories to match that idea. Now, both, cons both consistency bias and change bias have the same underlying purpose, which is to make us feel good about ourselves. And um, you may have heard the expression, never let the facts get in the way of telling a good story. And, well, your memories are a kind of story. And making a palatable story is the way all of our memories operate. Samuel Delaney's memory, Asimov's mother's memory, my memory, your memory. We all rewrite, rewrite the past because we don't want the facts to get in the way of the stories that we want to tell. It is a, it is a way for us to lie to ourselves. Now, we are accustomed to thinking that lying to yourself is a bad idea. But psychologists have also suggested that in limited quality, quantities, lying to yourself can actually be good for you. High self-esteem is usually an advantage in getting through life, and it's probably easier to have high self-esteem if your memories aren't completely accurate. If your memory tells you that you've usually been successful at the things you've tried, you are less likely to be discouraged by new challenges. Obviously. If you lie to yourself too much, you become outright delusional, and that's not going to help you get ahead. But there is plenty of room to go before you reach that point. Uh, we all have uh, ample opportunity to, to lie to ourselves and have it still work in our favor. And I expect that we are all taking advantage of that. So what happens when we all have video life logs that make it impossible for us to forget inconvenient things. Suppose you're arguing with someone about the death penalty which you oppose. In the past, you could claim that you would always oppose the death penalty. Uh, now, with video life logs, you know that actually there was a point where you supported the death penalty. What is that like? What does that do to you? What does it do to you to know that you and your spouse were happier 10 years ago than you are now? Will having a perfect memory reduce our self-esteem and make it you know, more difficult for us to get through the day? This makes it sound like video life logs are just an unambiguously bad idea. On the other hand, consider that many of the things that you would rather forget are exactly those things that the people around you might wish you'd remember. If you forget that you used to beat your child with a rope, that may make you feel better, but it probably will not make your child feel better. When you forget the harm that you have done to others, you are denying their experiences, which uh, can be hurtful in and of itself. So it may be that keeping a video life log is a good idea because Possibly, the benefits of being truthful to those around you will outweigh the costs of being honest to yourself. 
Um, and this, uh, this way of looking at things, this is definitely consistent with what you hear from the people who are currently interested in life logging. They all see it as a means of self-improvement. A lot of life loggers are involved with something known as the quantified self movement. Uh, right now, the quantified self movement is focused on recording your daily activity as a way of improving your health. So it's all about using a smartphone app to keep track of how many steps you've taken in a day, how many calories you've consumed, what your heart rate was throughout the day. But we can imagine that in the future, the quantified self movement might become more focused on making you more accurate, making you more honest. Suppose you had a smartphone app that uh, would fact check, fact checked any statement you make about yourself or about a past event. If you said something that was inconsistent with your previous statements or previous actions, the app would notify you that you were embellishing the truth. Now, some people would say, this app is a terrible idea because, um, because some people say the reason that we value honesty and consistency is because those indicate the depth of your commitment to your values. And they would lose all meaning if they come from mindlessly obeying a, you know, a smartphone app. Um, other people would say that it doesn't matter how you get there. If your goal is to treat people more consistently, uh, what's the harm in having software help you? You know, I don't know if an app like this is a good idea or not, but I, I would not be surprised to see a company marketing something like this in the future. Now, um, Yevgeny Morozov, who I believe will, uh, has spoken here, or will be speaking here, um, he has warned against uh, what he calls solutionism, which is the tendency to view everything as a problem that can be solved with technology. And, you know, you could certainly make the argument that inconsistency is actually not actually a problem that we need to solve. Uh, maybe if everyone is using life logs and being reminded of their inconsistencies, Maybe the result will be that our attitude toward inconsistency itself will change. Walt Whitman famously said, do I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. I'm large, I contain multitudes. Maybe we will become more willing to overlook inconsistent behavior in others because we will know that we are all guilty of it ourselves. Maybe we will come to value nuance more than we do now. But whether we like it or not, I believe that we are headed toward a future in which machines will do our remembering for us, and they will do it more accurately. This may seem unnatural, but we have been headed away from a state of nature for a long time. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Socrates felt something important would be lost when people relied on writing to remember things instead of using their own memories. And I have no doubt that to some extent he was right. But I would like to conclude with an anecdote about the reliability of people's memories when they did not have tools to help them remember. In the northern part of what is now the nation of Ghana, there used to be a kingdom called Ganja. And back around 1900, Ganja was divided into seven districts, each with a separate chief. And the way royal succession worked was that when the king of Ganja died, one of these seven chiefs was chosen to be the new king. And according to the people of Ganja, the reason for this was that the original founder of Ganja had seven sons, and he had divided the kingdom into seven districts and put one, so one son in charge of each. So the chief of each district was a descendant of the original founder of the kingdom. Now, by the 1950s, after the British had been administering the region for many years, Ganja no longer had seven districts. One district had been lost when the British had redrawn the borders, and another district had been merged with its neighbor because its chief had supported an invader. So there were now five districts in total. 
And in the 1950s, when you asked someone in Ganja to explain their system of succession, they said that their kingdom's original founder had had five sons, and he had divided the kingdom into five districts and put one son in charge of each. Now, the people of Ganja did not write down their history. They relied on their memories. The only reason we are aware that their history changed is because the British wrote it down. Now, to the people of Ganja, it probably would not have mattered much if you pointed out to them that the number of sons that their founder supposedly had had changed over the years. Because the point of that explanation was not to give a literal account of how Ganja was founded. The point was to tell a story that made sense of the way things are now. And I think we here living in the United States now can relate to that because a lot of the history that we were taught in elementary school was distorted to paint a prettier picture and make us feel better about ourselves. So, in the same way that nations have myths about how they came to be founded, I would suggest that people have myths about how they came to be the way they are now. We, we study historical documents in an effort to dig beneath the myth, the myth and find out what really happened in the past. And most of us think that it is important to engage in that type of examination because we think that there is value in knowing the truth, even when it is unflattering. So, once you start keeping a video life log, you will have the ultimate form of documentation for your personal history. And then the question becomes, how much value is there in knowing the truth about yourself? One of the reasons given for studying history is that whenever a nation lies to itself about what it did in the past, it commits an injustice against certain groups of people. So, is the same true, true of individuals? When you lie to yourself about what you did in the past, are you hurting anyone? Another reason that is often given for studying history is to avoid repeating the mistakes of the past. Would knowing more about the mistakes you've made in the past make you less likely to repeat those mistakes in the future? Technology will eventually provide us with a titanic amount of information about ourselves, including our mistakes. That is something I'm confident of. Whether or not we will be able to make good use of that information, whether or not we will be able to derive wisdom from it, that is something that remains to be seen. Thank you. My really simple question, if you could tell and spell the name of that first Microsoft guy that you mentioned. Uh, his name is Gordon Bell. Gordon Bell. So, yeah, B-E-L-L. -L. Thank you. And thank you. This is really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. So, in, a, in addition to all the potential benefits of life logging that, that, that you mentioned and, and um, getting past the need to memorize poetry and getting past the need to have certain kinds of memories of yourself if you have a video life log, potentially. Um, and also the, the elimination of, 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 of a certain need to potentially uh, distort, perform this distortion, which there's, there's an, extra, an argument, I think, that, that like all these things, memorizing or, or distorting, our, our, our kind of cognitive load that, that, that when we, we, we get these technologies that help us avoid these things, we free up kind of mental energy or space for higher level, more abstract processes that are somehow more valuable or, or more profound or something. I mean, do, do you make much of, of, of that kind of argument? Well, uh, that is definitely the argument that uh, Gordon Bell makes 
Um, he feels that by uh, storing everything, he is freeing up his brain for more important things. Um, you know, I am not sure if, you know, I, I, I don't know, has Gordon Bell become suddenly more creative and more productive and, you know, uh, doing more uh, interesting, valuable things? Um, I don't know. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, we would certainly like to think that, uh, uh, that we benefit by having a lot of information, say, written down. You know, uh, there was a time when people said that, you know, uh, uh, you could not, you did not really know something unless you held it all in your head. Uh, whereas now, you know, we hold a lot of things on paper. Um, I, remember, I remember reading an anecdote uh, about um, the cri about criticisms about the the invention of the index at the back of a book, because um, when someone first came up with uh, the idea of putting an index in the back of the book, people said, "This is a terrible idea. If you want to know what's in this book, read the book. Don't just you know take this shortcut and you know uh, go to that that particular page." But nowadays, I think we all think that indexes to books, they're pretty handy. We like them. Uh, they help us. Uh, but yeah, there is no good way to measure these things. There's no good way to measure, like, are we more productive now that we rely on indexes than we were in the days before indexes? Too many things have changed. You know, uh, there, th so there is no good way to compare. Um, are people more productive now that they are able to look up stuff instantly on Google, you know, on the web. I don't know if we have a good way of measuring that. I think that, uh, I mean, we all think it's convenient, don't we? But, um, uh, and, w you know, we are frustrated if we don't have access to it. Um, we are dependent on it now. Uh, are we better? Are we, you know, are we more productive uh, or more effective in some way than in the days when we had to look things up the old-fashioned way by flipping through a book. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we have a good way of measuring that. Um, uh, so, you know, so, so someone like you know, Gordon Bell would, I, I expect he would make the argument that the fact that you like these other things means you should like uh, life logging because it's just more of the same. It's offloading things and uh, it frees you up to, uh, uh, to, to think, to, uh, to, to focus on things when you don't have to remember them. Uh, you know, uh, but yeah, I, I guess uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, given that we, we don't have a good way of measuring, you know, these sorts of things, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's helping us. Hi, Ted. Nice to see you. And, uh, Hi, Karen. Fascinating to hear your lecture. Um, we know each other because we were actually college dorm mates in our first year, and that will come around later in my question, actually, so it's useful to know. Um, but one of the things that we did in that first year of college was sit around till late at night talking about questions that were weighty, like this. So I'm happy to reenact that. Um, after all these years. So my question has to do with um, how perhaps this life logging, or I've heard it talked about as self-tracking, relates to something about an anxiety of loss or an anxiety about um, having things change or losing track of being able to be access have things accessible to a person. And particularly, um, when I listen to you, I think about fixing things in a record focuses life in terms of the what of life, the factual d data of life, as opposed to focusing on the how of life. 
And so then I think about your um, example of memory being faulty. And I think when we talked on the phone last week, we misremembered who our first year college roommates were. And I thought that was actually a moment where um, something, we revealed ourselves to ourselves, potentially. Just to, just to clarify, I misremembered who she roomed with and she misremembered who I roomed with. We actually did remember who we had roomed with, you know, like our, our own roommates. So Indeed. <laughs> just, just, to, just to clarify that. So that um, slippage in data actually can be productive and interesting and useful and reveals layers of consciousness that perhaps are lost when we have absolute access to the what of life instead of the how or the why or the whatever, uh, the mystery that is um, inherent in the slippage. What do you think? Um, okay. Uh... All right, so there is what, what, I, what I'm reminded of by the first part of your question about uh, focusing on you know, the what rather than you know, maybe the how. Uh, what I'm reminded of is uh, there is a, there's a woman named Jill Price. Uh, there's a book about her called like, The Woman Who Couldn't Forget. And um, she is someone who, uh, uh, she came to the attention of psychologists recently because it seemed that she had uh, an, a perfect memory. She could, you could give her the, the, any date, and she could tell you what happened that day, what she did that day, uh, what she ate, you know, what she wore. It seemed like she had perfect recall of her life. Um, and uh, um, one, one psychologist, you know, uh, well, I mean, a bunch of psychologists tested her, and it, indeed, she had you know, uh, astonishing recall of hi historical events that she had lived through. However, she did not have a perfect memory because you know, when they tested her on simple things like you know, they gave her a list of words and then quizzed her on, her, quizzed her on them later, she did not have uh, a perfect memory. She only had a perfect memory for things that had happened to her. And one psychologist concluded that uh, what she had was not so much, uh, I mean, you know, she, 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 she had a, a really good memory, but uh, uh, what, she, what she had could also be characterized as an obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, an, obsessive, an obsession with her own life, because she, um, she maintained a, a, a minutely detailed diary. She'd been doing so, and she reread her diary entries uh, all the time. That was why she could remember them. Uh, she was uh, obsessed with her own past. That is, I think, an extreme uh, example of you know, a potential risk of this sort of uh, you know, life logging or data recording that uh, um, does it make you become obsessed with, uh, un does it cause you to become unhealthily obsessed with your past? Solipsistic. Yes. Uh, 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 is it, yeah, is it, uh, is it narcissistic or is it, is it solipsistic? Um, uh, you know, again, you know, I guess, I, I expect that that will be a risk that, I, some people will probably fall down that, you know, sort of rabbit hole. Um, uh, I don't, but I guess I don't, I don't expect that most people will. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess, I th um, but okay, so, but more, more, sorry, more broadly, the question of, um, whether focusing on what happened will uh, maybe uh, cause you to think less about you know, the meaning of what happened. Uh, um, you know, uh, there is, I, I guess, there's a, um, 
one, one, uh, one element that would be missing from a video life log is, uh, or, is, is the emotional content of, of memory. And we, uh, it is definitely the case that the emotions affect, you know, neurologists have again found that, you know, the emotions, uh, uh, emotions you're feeling at the time, they affect the way memories are laid down. Um, so there is a very, you know, strong emotional component to memories, and uh, that obviously, you know, shapes, you know, uh, our sense of ourselves, because, you know, there are events that come back to us and have a, a very strong emotional resonance to us. And um, uh, that element uh, would, you know, yeah, it's not clear that video, a video recording would do that. I mean, it's, I suppose it's possible that, you know, um, you could have the same sort of uh, emotional associations with, you know, the act of rewatching uh, those events on video. Um, but again, you know, I, yeah, I'm not sure. And I guess, you know, we probably, you know, we probably don't have enough data on, on that to know exactly how, uh, um, how well that would work. Yeah, because even the original experience of that the set of facts, those facts didn't have the emotional resonance. It was your experience of them that had that. So watching the video would be a reenactment with a difference. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thanks Hi. for coming and giving the talk. Um, I was curious, uh, with sort of prosthetic memories that we have today, which in some sense, things like Google even are, um, when we go to look up facts, which we may know, but we choose not to remember. Um, there, there seems to be, compared to just recalling something off the top of your head, a relatively high cost to going and Googling something as convenient as it is. And it seems like uh, when we have life logs, as great as or as terrible as that may be, that we would somewhat selectively choose to query those. And, you know, we would have to want to know the answer to some question quite a bit. Um, and so I'm curious if you've thought about uh, how that sort of changes. Well, um, you know, th that, uh, that is, that is uh, uh, you know, definitely an issue. But uh, by the, uh, the, the cost of using Google, you know, sort of just the convenient, the cost has been going down. Google becomes more and more convenient. There was a time when using Google, you know, uh, you would have to go to your desktop and, you know, uh, type in your query. Now you can uh, you can just uh, use your phone. People uh, are well. Okay, Google Glass is a smartphone that you wear uh, uh, on your face, and it is voice activated, and um, so that will uh, again reduce the cost of using Google uh, more, uh, even you know, even even further. Uh, now it, it 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 is true that you know there is still going to be some cost because even if you know even with some sort of voice activated uh, means of doing queries on your life log, that is still going to be a higher cost than you know simply you know thinking you know like rolling your eyes up and you know recalling it. Right. Um, but uh, uh, you know I think that the you know the steady increase, uh, instead of the increase in convenience of it, a de decrease in the, in the cost, uh, I think will inevitably uh, make us use it more and more often. Uh, and um, it may, uh, you know, it may never entirely replace our native memories, but I think that over time, you know, uh, it will you know, gradually sort of uh, subsume or you know, uh, be, just become a, a bigger and bigger component of the way that we think about our past uh, because it will, be, it will eventually become 
uh, very, very easy. So I, th I think that... Um, well, I guess I didn't mean perhaps so much, uh, you know, like, is that cost going to go down? But, for instance, in your story about Asimov's mother, um, she wouldn't actually recall having beaten her son until her son asks her, and it becomes a question that she bothers to ask. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, in that way, I guess, is it, you simply won't ask everything about the life log all the time. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm struggling to make okay. that question apparent. Okay. Um, well, I, more that uh, sense of the selectiveness okay. of querying it, and that how that changes how this might be used by people. Uh, that it won't just remind you of everything you've done constantly, but you know, if I want to, perhaps I just choose not to ask that question because I don't really want to know the answer. I, uh, I think that. Uh, like, well, okay, I guess it... Uh, it will depend, you know, it, it could depend on the, the, you know, how this, how this technology specifically develops. If, for instance, you have something that, like this smartphone app, which is fact-checking every statement you make, and let's say it's displaying, you're wearing Google Glass, and it's displaying just, uh, you know, some, you know, a fact-check of everything you're saying, if you're using that on uh, a regular basis, um, you know, you are no longer making explicit queries. You are sort of getting, you know, uh, uh, this, this fact-checking done uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, and if you, uh, well, I guess, so the question is, you know, there was no one moment when say, Asimov's mother forgot that she, you know, used to hit her son with a rope. Uh, so over, over the years, if you have this sort of fact-checking app running on everything you say, um, uh, maybe that will keep you on track so to speak, uh, uh, so that you, you uh, your memories will never diverge. Because you know, at, at the point that this conversation Asimov had with his mother, you know, it pro there had probably been some time oh, mm -hmm. during which, you know, some period of years over which her memory was able to diverge. But you know, maybe with sort of constant updates, her memory would not be able to diverge to that extent you know, it would always sort of keep her fairly close to the truth. I mean, th that is one possibility I can, I can imagine. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi. I just wanted to give a million thanks to Triple Canopy and MoMA PS1 for this series. It's just amazing. And my question, now pardon me because I'm not a scientist, but I was thinking, reminded of an article I read a few months ago in National Geographic. Um, there are astrophysicist specialists who believe that in late 2013 or early 2014, we're going to experience some massive solar flares from our sun and how these can cause some communication, some problems on our planet. And that got me to thinking about a future where we no longer exercise our memory to remember our lives. I have a very I'm one of those people with a good memory. Um, and it made me wonder, okay, we life log and some catastrophe or some ex exceptional event occurs, some electromagnetic pulse, a solar flare, which knocks out all this memory or a system or data which cannot yet be backed up to a safe storage facility. What happens? What, what about the existential quandary of who am I if I cannot remember and I can't Google who I am? Um, that's my question. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, um, there, were, uh, there was a science fiction story some years ago uh, by uh, the author Charles Strauss in which a character who, um, he had a pair of you know, these sort of uh, specs, these smart glasses, uh, and he relied on them so heavily that uh, when he he lost them, 
yeah, he, he basically forgot who he was. He didn't, he, you know, uh, because that had become, you know, uh, a major component of his brain was now residing in the, you know, in this, uh, these smart glasses that he was wearing. And, yeah, and, yeah, and without it, he was not himself. Um, and, you know, that is, in, I think, you know, that is definitely a real risk of this. Uh, because right now, okay, so when we, we, when we offload our information of trivia or, like, you know, movie facts or history that in the past we would have remembered, now it's all on Google, uh, that is not personal information. So, uh, uh, you know, we have not so far externalized personal information. We've mostly externalized, you know, just general information. Uh, and so, like, when there's a power outage, uh, you know, when, uh, when you are without internet, like after Hurricane Sandy, if you were without internet for, you know, a few weeks, it was really inconvenient, but, uh, um, yeah, you didn't lose any, any sense of yourself. Uh, and, you know, that would, that would be different now. If, if you start to externalize your, your personal memories, then, yes, you, you, uh, you are at greater risk of uh, 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 losing some, some part of yourself in the event of a failure. Um, I, uh, yeah, and I, I, you know, I think, you know, it is, it is safe to say that, you know, all, all technologies will fail at some point or other. You know, I have no doubt that uh, things will, will become more and more reliable, but they will never become perfectly reliable. Uh, so, uh, we, um, we definitely run the risk of, uh, you know, when we sort of uh, externalize uh, personal information, we, run, we definitely run the risk of, you know, uh, or we sort of increase the fragility of ourselves because some, this aspect of ourselves becomes vulnerable to things like power outages uh, in a way that was not the case uh, uh, up till now. So, yeah, I mean, I think that is, that is a, uh, a real downside. On the other hand, uh, I'm not sure that our, I don't know, has, has anyone ever like refrained from using technology because they were scared about the power outage scenario? Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know that that actually acts as a deterrent. I mean, so, I mean, I think that it, that will, it will, there will be a cost, but I guess I'm not sure that it will uh, actually, you know, Act as a deterrent because people 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 don't think about those scenarios when deciding whether to use a technology or not. When you you know decide to start you know using Google or using GPS, you're you are focused on when it's working. You're not so much thinking about you know what it would cost you when it stops working. And so by the time that you become dependent on it and it, you know it stops working and then you know uh, you're you're inconvenienced you know. It, it, it usually catches you off guard because, yeah, most of the time we're not thinking about that that, that contingency uh, early on in the when we're sort of making our decision about you know adopting a technology. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. It was uh, really fascinating. Um, it reminds me a little bit of the passage in Childhood's End. Uh, by Arthur G. Clarke, where when the aliens come and take over the Earth and pacify humans, they give us a television that can show us everything that ever happened. And so people stop believing in religion because they see that everything they were taught is a myth and never actually happened, which sounds kind of good, but also seems uh, maybe a little bit um, naive about what religion is, since, you know, it can often maneuver around simple things like mythology and things like that. Um, but, but actually what I wanted to ask was to follow up on the question about emotion. <clears throat> uh, life logging, it seems to me, the way it's practiced right now uh, by people like Gordon Bell, the way, as you describe it, is a mixture of external and internal uh, diary. In, in other words, like a, a video diary records external events. Uh, a written diary, in some cases, can record an internal event. Like, I was scared, I believed that 
God existed, all these kind of internal things that are not physically available to a video recording. So I guess my question is, is that you keep saying, you keep using the term what when we record everything, but of course that's not, it's not possible to record everything since not all facts are physical objective things. There are subjective states and things like that that are not physically available to a video recording technology. So, so how would that skew, I mean, how would that skew our sense of self if one part of what happened to us, the kind of external part is recorded, but the internal part is, is very inefficiently recorded at best, or maybe not any more better recorded than it is now by a written diary or a blog. Um, okay, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, because I, I mean, I don't believe that we'll be able to sort of simply record our thoughts. I, I, don't, I don't really see that happening. So it is, uh, it is true that uh, your internal thoughts will not be automatically recorded. Um, uh, I sus I mean, I, I could, I can envision a scenario where, um, uh, you, where, where, uh, where technology could, uh, make it easy for you to, uh, record a, a sort of uh, spoken, ongoing monologue. You could, people would be sort of narrating their own lives and having that recorded, you know, very quietly at, you know, a, you know, a not really audible level, but uh, not audible to others, but you could record that as a way of recording your thoughts. Um, uh, there, I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of possibilities that people, uh, because, I mean, there are a lot of possibilities that people are exploring, not in the context of life logging, but I could see them being applied in life logging. Because, for instance, um, uh, one of the things that people are interested in about, like, uh, wearing smart glasses is that um, it can, maybe, it can, uh, they're working on technology, glasses that will detect where your gaze is focused, what you were looking at, you know, uh, even the, you know, the depth of field. Are you looking at something in the foreground or in the background? What if you recorded that? What if you had a permanent record of that? Um, what if you, um, uh, what if you had technology? Because again, when people are talking about having smart glasses or augmented reality glasses, they're, you know, they're saying, oh, well, it could have image recognition of the things you're looking at and feed you information about it. So, it sees a person's face, pops up, you know, it does facial recognition, pops up that person's name and the information you need about that person. Uh, so now if you apply, apply that sort of technology, if you combine that with life logging, you know, okay, can we have software that somehow um, records some sort of uh, summary of the data stream that your augmented reality goggles were giving you on a daily basis? Because uh, that will be that will not be a record of your thoughts, but it will be a lot closer than you know. Uh, it'll be a lot closer and a lot more immediate than say writing a diary, uh, because you know uh, there, if there's some algorithmic way to summarize uh, like not only what you said during the day, but what you looked at, you know how long you looked at it, you know, um, and like if you were talking to yourself at the time. That could, you know, I think, bring you closer to having a record of, you know, your, if not your thoughts, your your monologue, your internal monologue uh, during the day, and uh, um, in the same way that, you know, uh, you know, the people who are engaged in, you know, quantified stuff, they are they are making some effort. It's, it's a very, it's not much effort, but they're making some effort to like record their activities. It's, it's not, it's not enti happening entirely automatically. They are, you know, uh, like, you know, occasionally doing some data input in some way. Um, and, you know, again, our habits evolve to the technology we use. So, you know, I can imagine a scenario where, you know, people, you know, uh, become, uh, used to narrating their, their thoughts, their internal monologue, uh, and recording it. 
uh, even if they don't do it now, you know, they, 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 might, find it, they might find it useful to, to do that because uh, it, it's, it's a way of, you know, uh, keeping track of things without having to write it down. It's like, oh yeah, I'll just, I'll just uh, make a, a very a brief verbal note and I can look it up later instead of having to write it down. It's, uh, so, I, you know, I can, again, I can see us moving in that direction. And so, yeah, it won't be a, it won't be recording your thoughts, but it gets closer and closer. Okay, so just for the uh, audio record, he said, that's the perfect place for dishonesty to creep in. Um, that, uh, you know, that is, I guess, uh, depending, on, depending on how it's implemented, are you going to be dishonest at the time? Like, uh, because, um, I don't know, if it's, for instance, if it is tracking the gaze where your eyes are looking at, you know, and you, if, uh, uh, if you were staring at, uh, at a woman's cleavage and your camera records it, I mean, uh, you, at, at the time, you're not going to, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna, your eyes are going to go where they go, and you are not going to be able to, you, uh, uh, you're not going to be able to sort of, like, uh, not look at her, I mean, look, look at her cleavage, but, you know, have your glasses record that you are not looking at her cleavage. You know, if, 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 if the glasses are recording that, you know, it's like, um, yeah, I think when we, when we watch the, the video of your eye tracking, we know what you were thinking then. You can't, you, you, it'll be hard for you to deny what you were thinking at that moment that you were you're, you know, staring at, at her cleavage. Um, and, you know, okay, it's possible that you could go back and edit that, but um, that will require, you know, a lot of, you know, that will probably require a lot of effort. Um, you know, uh, of course, it is also possible that maybe there'll be a great market for, you know, apps which, uh, which provide a completely sanitized record of all your activities, and um, maybe maybe the effect of life logging is that we will have uh, smartphone apps that help us lie to ourselves, that help us, you know, uh, you know, convince ourselves, yeah, we are good and virtuous people. Because I mean, yeah, there. Uh, that is that is definitely another way it could go. So, uh, I mean, I think yeah, th that that is that is a possibility as well. Um, yeah, uh, it, yeah. It, um, but again, you know, I guess uh, I think that you know uh, that is that is that is another response to the same sort of general question that we are going to have to confront. You know, uh, you know our uh, our undesirable behavior in a way, and you know w how we respond to it. Maybe we will, you know, try and correct it. Maybe we will, you know, make it worse. I don't know. But we're, we are, we will be responding to it as a result of you know these technological advances. Thanks so much. Thank you.